Great. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity to come back and, and speak today. Um, so uh, I was a fellow at the Farber and uh, uh, moved to Toronto in 2012 where we're continuing our work in adoptive cell therapy. At the time that we left, uh, cell therapy was never thought to possibly be of any real clinical use and the world of course changes uh, all the time and there's been quite an explosion clinically with immune therapy. So the talk today is really more of a clinical type talk rather than science and uh, to give you guys a flavor of what we're dealing with in the clinic and the different types of strategies that we're using. So you've heard a lot about uh, immunotherapy and how it's made major strides in the treatment of various cancers, lung cancer, melanoma, bladder cancer, um, and, and other types of cancers, not only uh, with uh, cell therapies and leukemias, but also with immune checkpoint inhibitors in solid tumors and, and some uh, heme malignancies. And what this really has resulted is in a significant improvement in overall survival, uh, at, which has revolutionized the treatment of diseases like melanoma. Uh, but we have, I think, hit a, a ceiling in terms of the efficacy uh, there was a big, uh, exciting study with IDO inhibitors, which was totally negative in melanoma, and it's really kind of uh, killed a lot of IDO studies, inhibitor studies, in, uh, and other combination studies uh, in solid tumors, although everyone is continuing to, to work hard towards that. And I think that the uh, combination with anti-CTLA-4 and, and anti-PD-1 uh, is illustrative in terms of uh, what we'll, the sort of links we'll go to clinically in terms of trying to achieve improvement in outcomes. People are excited about this uh, improvement in terms of progression-free survival. There is a small a measurable uh, survival benefit, but it's not statistically significant in the big randomized study that wasn't actually designed to show significance, so there's a lot of argument as to whether that's a true uh, benefit. But the most important thing is that for the IPI-NEVO anti-CTLA-4, anti-PD-1 combination therapy, this bit of benefit comes at a big cost in terms of toxicity. So the, in terms of immune checkpoint inhibitors, the dogma is that patients with a minimal initial immune recognition of the tumor is uh, potentiated by uh, anti-CTLA, sorry, anti-PD-1, where we can see in melanoma response rates in the 40% range. But to improve this, there is a host of different uh, combination therapies that are under investigation. And uh, the IDO uh, uh, failure has uh, called into question as to whether or not these combinations will really be beneficial. Uh, another strategy for uh, trying to uh, improve upon the, um, the initial uh, benefit or the, the sort of ceiling benefit that I was mentioning is to try to engineer responses, and one possible way is to uh, do this through adoptive cell therapy. So adoptive cell therapy clinically is, uh, exists in three major types. There's tumor infiltrating lymphocytes that are T cells generated from the tumor, expanded and then infused as a therapy. A uh, strategy where you take T cells from peripheral blood and then expand uh, selectively through either uh, stimulation in vitro against various peptides, perhaps with uh, artificial antipresenting cells or with dendritic cells to expand uh, tumor-specific uh, cells. And then the final strategy, which is uh, the most recent uh, exciting results, are to engineer a response genetically, which then uh, results in uh, a T cell product that's able to target tumor. That's where the chim chimeric antigen receptors and uh, uh, gene engineered T cell receptors strategies fall. So all of these types of studies that uh, investigators and companies uh, are uh, taking place require a, a huge effort in terms of manufacturing. At Princess Margaret, uh, our manufacturing team is, is headed by Lynn Nguyen, 
who is supported by a large group of, of people involved in quality management as well as expansion of T cells and uh, uh, as well as uh, dendritic cells. So that, uh, the Princess Margaret, when I got there in 2012, there had already been an effort to uh, work on the uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte pro uh, problem. Um, and the strategy that was set up at uh, Princess Margaret in collaboration with uh, the National Cancer Institute with Steve Rosenberg involves taking uh, tumor samples where you mince up or uh, uh, collagenase digest uh, tumor samples uh, and then uh, grow T cells in uh, multiple subcultures uh, uh, with high dose IL-2 uh, and media and then expand these through, uh, once you establish a culture, expand uh, promising cultures in a rapid expansion protocol uh, that are then infused as a product. Patients undergo lymphodepletion with chemotherapy, a high dose chemotherapy that results in neutropenia and other toxicities. T cells of large numbers are infused and then patients receive IL-2 injections. Um, it, uh, the standard NCI strategy is to use IL-2 IV at high dose. We used an intermediate dose of uh, uh, subcutaneous IL-2 mainly because the Princess Margaret doesn't have uh, its own ICU, would have patients when they need to get particularly sick have to go next door to a hospital with an ICU. So again, the strategy is you do these initial studies uh, or cultures and this was something that was always a black box to me before getting involved with it. There's actually uh, an initial culture where a few million cells are, are expanded into subcultures. And then these undergo a rapid expansion where uh, T cells are exposed to allopBMCs, OKT3, anti-CD3 antibody, and IL-2 uh, for a rapid expansion protocol and then infused. I think in the future, uh, modifications of these of these strategies will result in probably better products for infusion. So our initial study uh, did show clinical activity with responses in patients. Um, although we we did note that while we had a nice waterfall plot, the the durability of the responses were not uh, as advertised in the uh, NCI experience. And I think the main reason for that is that patients had uh, previously already received quite a number of other effective immunotherapies, such as anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 therapies. We participated in the early pembrolizumab studies. So because uh, these uh, checkpoint inhibitors are so much easier to give, patients, of course, went on to, get, to receive that treatment and rather than waiting two months before receiving TIL. And then uh, would come on to our studies. Um, we did perform a extensive uh, uh, analysis of patient samples with our immune monitoring team, uh, uh, studying the patient tumor samples and, and peripheral blood. And what we did is, uh, identify is that the infusion products did, in, in many patients, result in uh, engraftment of, of uh, T cells um, that were present in the infusion product, and we saw shifts in the uh, V-better repertoire uh, in the peripheral blood of patients. And here's an example of a patient who had an increase in V-beta 13.1 and V-beta 16 in the context of a response to therapy. This patient had a response that lasted six months, but then uh, experienced further progression. Uh, he uh, received anti-CTLA-4 with no benefit. And we noted that that 13.1 continued to be increased and had high PD-1 expression. Uh, the patient uh, then went on to pembrolizumab and had a very nice response to therapy, suggesting that the T cells we infused had high PD-1 expression. Another patient who had a very brief response, here's a pelvic mass that was rapidly growing and then responded uh, to therapy. This patient, unfortunately, had another lesion on the chest wall that showed progression at month three. Uh, that was resected, and we saw high PD-1 expression in the tumor. This patient uh, went on to targeted therapy, but not immunotherapy. So I don't know whether he would have responded again to anti-PD-1, despite the fact that he had previously been on pembrolizumab. 
But in any case, uh, this, uh, these, uh, this data suggested that perhaps combination with TIL and anti-PD-1 therapy would be a reasonable strategy. So uh, we have an investigator-initiated study where patients receive TIL and then go on to pembrolizumab. Uh, we're studying patients with uh, ovarian cancer as well as melanoma in this uh, clinical study. The, uh, another uh, uh, challenge with the, uh, with the rapid expansion protocol is that you need to have uh, uh, allogeneic feeder cells to present, uh, to cross-link uh, OKT3. Um, so a lot of groups have worked on possible replacement of the uh, uh, allo feeder cells with artificial antigen presenting cells. We've worked with a K562-based uh, strategy where we have uh, anti-CD3 um, uh, on the artificial antigen presenting cell as a method for expanding T cells. And in this uh, protocol, we take uh, peripheral blood uh, and or, or tumor uh, and then stimulate cells with uh, APC expressing OKT3 along with uh, CD80 and, and other co-stimulatory molecules. We're able to show expansion of T cells, and in comparison to uh, the Dynel uh, beads, the large beads that are able to be used as stimulators, we see that we uh, can stimulate a, a faster expansion of CD8 T cells as opposed to uh, CD4 T cells. And we're able to expand tumor filtrating lymphocytes, so we're continuing to work on this strategy as a way to expand and possibly uh, enhance the TIL products. Uh, one of the other uh, uh, postdoc in the lab, uh, 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 Dr. Kujoya, uh, compared the uh, APC beads versus uh, the uh, OKT3 expressing uh, cell lines and found that the uh, that there was a better expansion of central memory type uh, T cells with the uh, artificial APC. And probably the reason why the artificial APC is superior to the beads is that the, the, uh, the living cells are destroyed by the T cells so that you, get, uh, you don't get continuous uh, stimulation as you do with uh, beads. So uh, one strategy to improve uh, uh, bead products is to, to deplete the beads from uh, T cell uh, uh, cultures, and you can result in a better expansion of what we think are probably better cells for, for treatment. So, currently in Toronto, we're continuing our investigator initiated studies with mesothelioma, ovarian cancer, and melanoma, and uh, also are participating with IOVANCE. Uh, who are developing uh, TIL as a, com as a commercial product. So for uh, the art uh, sorry, for peripheral blood uh, antigen-specific T-cell adoptive cell therapy, uh, when uh, I was at the Dana-Farber in Lee Nadler's lab, I collaborated with now to Hirano, another postdoc in the lab, uh, where uh, we generated a clinical version of his uh, artificial APC that express HLA class 2 along with co-stimulatory molecules CD80 and CD83 to expand uh, CD8 T cells in an antigen-specific manner. We pr conducted a clinical trial where patients received uh, two infusions of a melanoma-specific uh, 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 T cell uh, uh, product. Uh, that recognized MART1 melanoma, which is a melanoma-associated antigen. Uh, and we saw some anti-tumor effects uh, with just infusion. There was no lymphodepletion, no IL-2 cytokines. Uh, patients had minimal toxicity. There was no cytokine release syndrome. And, the, and in this uh, one patient who had a durable response, we saw evidence of, of infiltrating T cells post-infusion with CD8, and were able to detect the, um, the MART1 uh, specific cells as well as there was a large proportion of other CD8 T cells present within the tumor. Uh, and um, uh, although we, at that time, we weren't able to identify what those uh, samples recognized. And um, we also noted that in several of the patients across the, pro the protocol, we had engraftment of, of the T cells that we infused. 
Um, and we saw that while it was a small uh, percentage, it was still measurable consistently, and we saw an increase in the central memory phenotype in these patients. Um, in one particular patient, we saw no evidence of disease anti-tumor activity, but we saw a slight increase in the number of MART1 specific T cells. Patient went on to receive anti-C2A4 antibody back when ipilimumab was new, and we saw a massive expansion of the T cells uh, um, that were present, and these uh, we were able to track them genetically and just found that the uh, that these T cells were uh, present in the product. And uh, for the five patients in that particular study that received um, anti-C2A4, three of them had uh, partial responses, which, which is either really good patient selection or uh, uh, a surprisingly high percentage of responses because the response rate is only about 10 to 15 percent in patients with melanoma. So um, along with the, the uh, TIL study, we have a study with uh, uh, T cells of uh, 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 these MART1 specific T cells that are infused uh, along with pembrolizumab. Uh, there's been some delays in getting the technology transferred from uh, Dana-Farber to Toronto, but we're hoping to open this cohort soon in Toronto. Uh, another uh, strategy for expanding uh, antigen specific T cells is through oncolytic viruses. Uh, one of the uh, pluses of Canada is that there's quite a large group of people that are interested in oncolytic viruses and that there are a few Canadian-based uh, companies that are uh, working on this problem. Uh, John Bell in Ottawa, who uh, he, he and I are collaborating on a project with uh, their Maraba virus. Uh, Maraba virus is an oncolytic virus that has some anti direct anti-tumor activity, but it's particularly good at uh, expanding T cell responses, especially central memory T cell responses, because the oncolytic virus not only will uh, grow and, and uh, preferentially within tumor and, and induce an anti-cancer effect, but also is um, uh, the oncolytic virus will infect uh, spleen cells and present antigen, resulting in, in uh, uh, expansion of, and presentation of, of antigen. So uh, 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 Dr. Wan in uh, McMaster has looked at uh, several models where he uh, looks at adoptive cell therapy versus oncolytic virus and will see a minimal effect, but then when you combine uh, these strategies, you can see an anti-cancer effect. Uh, so we have a, a, a clinical trial that's in the works to uh, combine uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, infusion of these uh, central memory T cells and then uh, vaccinate with oncolytic virus, and that's hopefully going to open up in the next year. And then uh, finally, for uh, gene-engineered T cells, uh, there's, as I mentioned, there's been a lot of excitement in the heme malignancies. I uh, uh, worked in heme malignancies and solid tumors at the Farber, but have focused mainly on solid tumors. The, uh, for the chimeric antigen receptors, just as a, just to note, there's a lot of excitement in CD19 cars where uh, tumors express CD19. Uh, as well as normal B cells, but you can, rep you can basically get along without a B cell. So if uh, the, the, all of the excitement that uh, you're reading about in the New York Times in regards to uh, the uh, CAR T cells is really focused on the CD19 CARs. There are a lot of efforts with uh, mesothelin and other targets for uh, solid tumors, and there are a few other uh, heme malignancies with uh, surface antigens that are being targeted. But so far for solid tumors, we're really uh, challenged in finding the, the right uh, uh, method or, and target uh, for uh, patients with uh, chimeric antigen receptors. Um, but in any case, for heme malignancies, which are often not very responsive to uh, immune modulation with immune checkpoint inhibitors, you can see quite remarkable benefit from the chimeric antigen receptor. Now, one of the challenges for uh, these, tech, uh, these uh, uh, 
clinical challenges for the heme malignancies in, in chimeric antigen receptor uh, uh, CD19 uh, directed therapy is cytokine release syndrome. This is an inflammatory response which is uh, uh, clinically described as fevers. Um, uh, patients will develop tachycardia, uh, third spacing with hypotension can have uh, pulmonary edema. There's also a severe uh, neurologic syndrome, cytokine uh, release encephalopathy syndrome that's associated with uh, uh, brain edema. And this uh, syndrome can be quite uh, severe, but appears to be driven mainly, uh, well, through multiple cytokines, but can be reversed with antagonism of uh, uh, IL-6. Uh, so therefore, clinically, patients are uh, being monitored closely and given tocilizumab, which is an anti-IL-6 receptor antibody, uh, and can get most patients through uh, this type of toxicity. The uh, severe uh, cytokine release syndrome is often associated with high disease burden, um, but there's also seems to be a, a link between efficacy in terms of, of uh, responses to therapy and, and some uh, uh, fever or at least grade one uh, cytokine release syndrome. So um, at, to deal with the challenge of uh, lack of appropriate targets in solid tumors, another strategy is to uh, generate uh, antigen-specific uh, T cells by engineering cells uh, to express uh, alpha-beta T cell receptor so that you can um, uh, direct uh, uh, T cells against endogenously expressed antigens that then uh, present on MHC molecules the uh, antigenic peptide. So uh, one of the challenges of TCR uh, engineered pr uh, products is that while you can get the transduced TCR into the T cell, uh, the uh, response is uh, inhibited somewhat, or sorry, the, the, the efficacy of the T cell is inhibited by uh, the challenge of mispairing with endogenous TCR uh, as, and then also competition with uh, uh, downstream elements from the TCR. So a group in uh, Japan has worked on a strategy where small inhibitory RNAs are uh, part of the retrovirus that transduces the T cells with the uh, uh, alpha beta. And this downregulates endogenous TCR while sparing the transduced TCR, resulting in higher expression of the T cell receptor. And in, in animal models, suggests a, a better uh, uh, response. Um, what we've been uh, conducting a clinical trial at Princess Margaret in pal parallel to another trial being. Uh, conducted in Japan. Uh, this is where patients with NYSA1 expressing tumor undergo phlebotomy. Uh, we then transduce the uh, uh, retrovirus to transduce alpha beta against uh, uh, NYSA1 and then infuse uh, uh, patients with a T cell receptor. So far, we've uh, treated six patients that uh, have to leave early today because we're treating our seventh patient today uh, with uh, uh, this uh, product. And what's interesting is that three of the patients have had grade one cytokine release syndrome, even though we're only, um, even though we're only uh, uh, giving lymphodepletion with cyclophosphamide alone, most of the uh, uh, cell therapy uh, studies require fludarabine and cyclophosphamide to get uh, more profound lymphodepletion. We get sort of mild lymphodepletion uh, with this strategy, but uh, uh, we are seeing uh, this uh, phenomenon of cytokine release syndrome, which was also uh, noted in Japan and, and uh, was presented at ASH last year. Uh, we're also seeing some anti-tumor activity in patients that have synovial sarcoma, which is a uh, 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 solid tumor that has very high expression of NYSA1 by tumor cell targets. So, so far we've treated uh, six patients. We've had several uh, patients with stable disease, uh, and the, as I mentioned, we've had three patients with cytokine release syndrome, and we've had two uh, very deep uh, partial responses. We have additional patients. There are two synovial patients, an ovary patient, and just 
that are being treated. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll be finished with our nine patients that we need for the recommended phase two dose. Uh, biomarker data will be presented at SITSI, um, hopefully if our abstract is, is accepted. And um, uh, also our collaboration with uh, uh, Takara is ongoing and we're planning to add additional uh, cohorts, uh, including a double dosing cohort where we infuse cells on day one and then two weeks later infuse cells uh, uh, on day 14 without additional lymphodepletion to see whether uh, double dosing will result in, in uh, uh, better efficacy. So uh, in Toronto, we also uh, we have this NYSA1 study. Uh, we've collaborated with Adaptimmune, um, uh, which is also an English company uh, conducting clinical trials here. Um, and uh, uh, we are participating on MAY-J10 and MAY-J4 studies. I think they're also in Oxford, right? Yeah. Um, and then the heme malignancy group is working on several studies with uh, chimeric antigen receptors. Um, and I mentioned these studies before. I'll also direct you to my collaborator, Naoto Hirano, who uh, recently published a, uh, a uh, series of, of experiments uh, looking at a novel chimeric antigen receptor where uh, JAK-STAT signaling domain appears to uh, result in a superior anti-tumor effects uh, for a uh, next generation CAR T cell. So uh, without, uh, all, all this work requires uh, all of these different groups, not only in the clinical side, but also in the lab and generating the pro uh, uh, products. And then I'm um, happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah. For the second, uh, second infusion, you said, oh, thank you. Uh, for the second infusion of your uh, CAR T or uh, TCR therapy, you said without lymphodepletion, right? Do you see an immune response or do you see, have you, do you have any experience in comparing the first infusion to the second infusion? Yeah, well, so for the, for that particular TCRT study, we haven't, that hasn't opened yet, so we haven't treated any patients. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a big, so we've seen a lot of problems in patients who are not the best quality patients undergoing lymphodepletion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, I, do, I really do think that if we can generate products that require less lymphodepletion, it's going to be better for patients because there just are some patients who are too sick. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, some of the, you know, the pediatric population does really well because they're quite healthy and they can handle a lot of lymphodepletion. But when we treat these 70 and 80 year olds, mm -hmm. which, you know, even they, everybody wants to live forever. So we, we do treat patients in their 70s and 80s. You can run into, or even 50s, you can run into a lot of problems. So for the uh, artificial antigen presenting cell MART1 specific T cell study mm -hmm. that we did, uh, we did ha we had no lymphodepletion in that study, the one that I that we did at the Dana Farber, and you really saw very little change. But you could, you know, because we had great pentamers with you know, very low background, you could detect uh, a slight shift in the cells that we infused. So I think that there is a role of combining cell therapies with immune checkpoint inhibitors or other immune modulators that maybe you could get away from lymphodepletion. But in general, lymphodepletion appears to be needed to get some minimal response. Mm -hmm. um, for the, the, the Takara product with the small inhibitory RNA, um, there were some initial studies that were done in Japan where they looked at uh, no lymphodepletion as they did dose escalation. And the, you know, there was minimal uh, a response. They haven't, no one is in, for that product, no one has gone back and infused cells with zero lymphodepletion. So for this study where we give lymphodepletion on day minus three, and then the patient gets two infusions, uh, we're very interested, interested to see whether we still see a bump or, or, you know, what's going to happen in those patients who have recovery of their lymphocytes. Mm -hmm. 
But in general, when you give cyclophosphamide or fludarabine, they'll have lymphode lymphodepletion that lasts many, many months. weeks and months. So I think you know, repeated infusions probably don't need repeated lymphodepletion, especially for products that are trying to get around you know, the, the problem, you know, to try to have a, an active a cell product. Mm -hmm. Till therapy, those cells are so major, you know, they've gone, on, or at least the traditional Rosenberg type till therapy has gone through thousands of, of, of rounds of replication. And, and it really are majorly expanded. Those are, those are tired T cells. They need everything they can get. So patients need to have lymphodepletion for those studies. Mm -hmm. I think that for TIL therapy, if it's going to become part, you know, Iovance is, is studying uh, uh, T cell therapy using the standard method, and hopefully they'll find some activity um, and, a, and a niche for developing it clinically. But I think for the future for TIL therapy, it, it, we really need to figure out a way to make a better TIL for infusion, something that could actually survive without severe lymphodepletion. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, very nice presentation. Thank you. And uh, regarding the, uh, the TIL therapy um, and, and, and an exhausted uh, phenotype of those T cells, can you comment on, does that change after you expand them? So the, I think the Rosenberg group has shown that the phenotype of the cells in vitro um, reverts once you infuse or at least you know, when they track the T cells that are infused, the ones that survive have a younger phenotype. They're higher in CD28 or CD27. I suspect that the majority of the cells are lost after infusion and there's a subpopulation that are engrafting. So um, there, there are uh, Cassian Yee, who's, who was at uh, University of Washington and moved to MD Anderson, he feels that if you uh, so he does a lot of work with T-cell clones, and they feel that if you basically imprint the cells at the time of initial uh, establishment of the cell lines with IL-21 and IL-15, that those products will, um, will have, are of central memory type once you infuse. But when, if, you, if you phenotype them prior to infusion, they all look like exhausted T-cells. Um, so whether it's a subpopulation they're able to engraft and survive versus a reversion, it's, it's not clear. Stan Riddell does have some monkey data that suggests that IL-15, IL-21 can imprint the cells so that even though their phenotype has, looks exhausted in vitro, they, they are reverting uh, post-infusion. Hi. Yeah, uh, just with the TIL therapy, I haven't followed it sort of from the beginning that much, but is, is there any risk of transferring cancer cells themselves in, as part of the cell culture? Well, the, uh, so definitely there is that risk, and so, but the, the cells are so severe, you know, so, they undergo so many uh, rounds of expansion that you can't really detect them. Uh, very well in vitro, and then if you do PCR, there for some of these tumor products. Although it's not routinely done, um, it is uh, not there. You know, most of the cultures are negative. So, but most of the patients treated have metastatic disease. So that's so clinically, the regulators have not required you to rigorously show that there's no uh, tumor cell pro uh, present. Um, the so I mean, I, but I think that if if TIL therapy really did take off, and then we started to treat patients who had no, and it was safe, um, and we started treating patients who had no evidence of disease, we would have to go back and look at that question very carefully for patients. Thank you. So, <laughs> yeah. So when uh, you are expanding the population, oh sorry. By using the oh sorry. Okay. All right. No, no, that's we can go. <laughs> um, 
considering lots of uh, difference between the pediatric and adult uh, immune status in terms of immune tolerance or um, memory or uh, balance between the uh, Treg or memory cells in pediatric and adult, do you see any lots of responses between these two groups? Well, so I don't treat pediatric, but Carl June has commented on that the the pediatric population, you're, when you when you generate T cells from kids versus from older adults, the starting T cells that you're engineering have a lot more memory and effector memory cells in the adults compared to kids. So you have a lot more naive cells. And I think that that's partly the reason why uh, efficacy of CAR T cells is a little bit higher, partly, in, in pediatrics. But you know, the kids' leukemias and are easier to treat with chemotherapy. So uh, it's not 100% sure, certain that that's the issue. Um, but I, I do think that uh, adults, you know, as we age, we have a higher percentage of, of um, more antigen experienced cells that have less replication capacity. Yeah, my question is, uh, when you are expanding these fields by using the allo PBMCs, don't you see the element of allogenic PBMCs when you are infusing the yeah, you could. So it's an, the, the, well, the allo PBMCs are irradiated, so okay. they don't survive beyond a few days um, in culture. Um, but you may expand an auto T cell that has antigen spe specificity for an allo antigen, but this is an auto product, and so you're not transfusing uh, allo uh, to those patients. They may develop other. Uh, sensitivity to other um, uh, transplants or you know transfusions or those sorts of issues but you know one of the ideas with artificial APC is to try to get rid of some of that risk by uh, replacing the allo PBMCs I will say that with uh, the the it's not there the PBMCs are not just giving just it's not just cross-linking CD3 because uh, the artificial APC can partially replace an allo PBMC, but the best um, the best response is by also including some uh, PBMCs in the culture, even with uh, the uh, artificial APC. Uh, another question, just following up from the um, from the challenges of CAR T and solid um, tumors. So you mentioned mesothelium as a potential target uh, as well. Um, what are the main Main challenges in regards to identification of some of those new targets. Is it, is it really? Is it just that the CAR T is really just best suited for um, hematological diseases? Well, so a lot of the epithelial tumors have epithelial antigens, and we need our epithelium. Whereas the B cell related malignancies uh, have a lot of shared B cell antigens that can be targeted, and then you're you're okay with losing uh, the B cell. So the, and you know, that, that's actually seen with, uh, so I mean, that's the main, the main challenge, is that we need to find in solid tumors an antigen that's restricted just to a uh, tumor. And unfortunately, all the cancer testis antigens, which are restricted to tumors um, and can be highly expressed in some tumors, Unfortunately, those are all intracellular antigens, so you have to use a TCR uh, type strategy. But so a lot of groups are looking for targets that are expressed uh, or to try to look at a combination of targets that are expressed. So there are several novel uh, strategies for generating a, a car that uh, will kill if you have two antigens expressed, well, but yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. But not if you have just a single. All right, well, thanks Thank very, much. very much. Indeed.